morning. Welcome to the First Baptist Church of Rusk Sunday morning Bible study. We're continuing our series through the New Testament book of Acts. And today we're going to be looking at verses from chapter 14. Of course, we're dealing with the uh, missionary journeys of uh, Paul and Barnabas. So I encourage you to get a Bible or a scripture device and turn with me to chapter 14 of the book of Acts. Let's have a prayer at this point. Father, thank you for life itself and for uh, the life that you've given us, the meaningful life that you've given us through our relationship with you based on our faith in Jesus Christ, your son. So I thank you for everything about life, even the, the difficult parts, uh, sometimes painful, sometimes uh, trying, but uh, I thank you again for the privilege of your word to study, to share, to try to proclaim your word uh, represented by this Bible study today. Help me, help me to speak what you want me to say and to have the thoughts that you want me to share. And I pray that you'll cause them to be useful <clears throat> in someone's life. And then here's this Bible study. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. The, uh, the area in which Paul and Barnabas were, were ministering is in modern-day Turkey. It was called uh, Asia Minor back in those days, I suppose. But, uh, and, and he, uh, he and Barnabas had, had gone out, sent from the church back in Antioch, of Syria uh, to spread the gospel and they were faithful to that commissioning and that call as they got into uh, a town area village called Antioch this was not their home church back in Syria but in the region of Pisidia uh, they they were they preached about Jesus, they were met with opposition, and they were run out of town. Uh, and so they moved on, uh, and the next town they went to was named Iconium. Uh, I think it was a hundred miles or so from where uh, Antioch was. But, uh, yeah, or uh, maybe not that far. But uh, they, they went there, and at that point, uh, they uh, began to preach. And their custom was to always go to the Jewish synagogue first, and, uh, because uh, that was Jesus' pattern. Jesus had uh, instructed his apostles that followed him when they sent them out on a mission work to go first to the Jewish people. And uh, that's what so that's what Paul and Barnabas did. But they met with opposition there uh, in uh, Iconium. And in fact that is uh, the uh, the the Jewish leaders who had run and run them out of Antioch of Pisidia uh, kind of followed them there. Uh, and, uh, and and created a uh, uproar and opposition in Iconium to, um, to Paul and Barnabas preaching. Um, And it says in verse 4 of chapter 14, the multitude of the city was divided, part 
part of the city, part of the people, sided with the Jewish uh, leaders opposing the apostles, and part of it were receptive of uh, Paul and Barnabas and their preaching. Um, and so they, uh, um, um, opposition uh, arose and got stronger. And so it says in verse 6, when they became aware of it, they fled to Lystra. Lystra, another uh, city. Uh, yeah, I think this was one that was about 100 miles from uh, Iconium. And uh, they went there. And of course, they began to preach there. And in Lystra, they encountered a, a crippled man who had been crippled or lame from his birth, never been able to walk. And uh, uh, the, but the man was listening to Paul, Paul in the preaching. And Paul uh, noted, noticed that the man was listening intently to him. And, uh, and the Holy Spirit uh, indicated to Paul that this man was ready to profess faith in Jesus Christ. And so Paul said with a loud voice, verse 10, stand up straight on your feet. And he did. He leaped up and began to walk. Now, verse 11, when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice saying in their language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. In other words, they, they took this miraculous healing of the crippled man to be an indication that Paul and Barnabas were gods uh, that had come uh, into their midst. And, uh, and they, they referred to Paul as uh, um, Hermes, uh, name of one of the gods, of the Greek gods, because Paul was the main spokesman of the mission team, and they referred to, uh, they thought of Barnabas as Zeus, who was really one of the major uh, predominant gods, small g gods in this time to, uh, dimension and area. Uh, but it says when, verse 14, when the Barnabas Paul heard this, heard them uh, speaking about them as being gods, uh, they ran uh, to them and began to tear their clothes and as a symbol of alarm and uh, crying out, don't, uh, don't refer to us, don't think of, of us as gods. But we're just men, we're human beings like you. Uh, and we've just come to preach the true uh, message of God to you. In other words, they've tried to stop this, this concept of worshiping them. <clears throat> and they said, we are members, verse 14, we are members of the same human nature as you, and we are preaching to you that you should turn from useless things, that is, vain, mistaken worship of these ideas and people who are not gods at all, uh, and to worship the true God who made heaven and earth uh, and, and in control of everything. And then Paul's message he began, he continued with his preaching. And uh, he said, uh, he noted that God had had in the past uh, put up with the false worship of people on earth, but that he, uh, he had shown himself to everyone by nature, by the gifts, by universal blessings of rain and 
crops and fruit and uh, all these common blessings of life that uh, people depend on. Uh, but they were still, the mob was still uh, trying to proclaim them as gods and to sacrifice uh, some type, make sacrifices to them. Uh, and then it says that, uh, that some of the Jewish religious leaders that Paul and Barnabas had encountered back in Antioch of Pisidia and Iconium, they arrived there in Lystra and began to uh, uh, persuade the crowds that Paul was a, was a heresy, ungodly, and uh, and so the people got in such a opposition that they stoned Paul. They actually stoned him. They started throwing stones on him and hitting him. And of course he fell to the ground and they thought the people, the Jewish people that were doing this thought he was dead. But it says, verse 20, he was not dead and after the Jewish crowd that had stoned him after they left, the uh, the Christian uh, followers of Paul, with Paul, they came uh, and surrounded him to check on him, and he, he got up. He got up and went into the city. But the next day, he left, he and Barmas left, and moved on to another town, named Derby, D-E-R-B-E, Derby. Uh, in other words, they, uh, they, uh, they, they weren't afraid, but they were using common sense <clears throat> to uh, move on and not just stay there in the face of the strong opposition and, and dangerous behavior of the people there in Lystra. They moved on. Well, sometimes that uh, could be said of us as Christians today as we try to share the gospel. If we meet with hostility and it's causing a great uh, confusion and turmoil, uh, sometimes we need to be wise in, in how we proceed. And sometimes it may be God's will for us to move on and try to uh, witness to other lost people uh, and leave the situation of turmoil, at least temporarily, as we'll see that Paul did. So they left and they went, uh, they went to, uh, to uh, Derby and they preached there and it says, verse 21, they made many disciples. In other words, the response in the town of Derby was positive, and people responded to the gospel, and apparently their ministry there was very successful. And after they had been there for a while, they decided to retrace their, their travel route back to Lystra, the previous town from which they gone to Derby, and then from there to Iconium, the previous town before they went to Lystra, and then from there to Antioch of Pisidia, uh, where they had begun their ministry in this area. And it says they, they went back to strengthen the souls of the disciples. In other words, they wanted to be sure that, that these people who had seemed to respond to the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, were in fact following through and staying in their faith. Uh, and, and they were strengthened. They would encourage them and teach them and, uh, and help them to grow as followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, and what they would also do, do they, uh, it says they strengthened them and they exhorted them or encouraged them to continue in the faith, saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. 
Now that's an interesting verse there and reality that that Paul and Barnabas said, uh, said be ready for opposition and persecution. Uh, those that uh, will reject the gospel of Jesus and be ready. They're going to oppose you and uh, you might as well be ready, but hold fast, stand fast, because you're going to face, he says, many tribulations in, as you as you grow, as you enter the kingdom of God, that is, as you grow in your Christian faith and your walk with God through faith in Jesus Christ. So, we well, you and I need to know that. And I think that's uh, really something that not only we can be assured of, but we can uh, wonder if we're really facing opposition and persecution. And if not, why not? Why are we not? Because the scriptures say, this is in Second uh, Timothy, also written by Paul. that all who try to live a godly life in Christ will encounter persecution. Let me read it to you. Um, Verse 12 of chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, Paul writes, Yes, all who desire to live godly lives in Jesus Christ, following Christ, will suffer persecution. So that is a promise, it's a reality from Scripture. And so if we live a life free from persecution and opposition, that may mean that we're not being as active and aggressive and as bold in our witness uh, for Jesus as we should be. <clears throat> All right, now, um, it says then in verse 23, and when they uh, had ordained elders in every church, they prayed and fasted and commended them to the Lord. So what that what that shows is that Paul and Barnabas, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, were, were selecting leaders for these churches, these Christian groups. And I don't know that you could call them churches yet, but they were groups of Christians in the town of Derby and in the town of Lystra and in the town of of Iconium and in the town of Antioch of Pisidia, where there had been some reception, positive reception to the gospel. They appointed some leaders. They, they uh, called them um, elders, which they, they may have fulfilled the role of pastor, leading a group of Christians there. Might not have been a church building, might have been meeting in some of the homes, but what, what they did, they, they, they uh, Paul and Barnabas uh, endorsed them and commended them to the other Christians there as, as spiritual leaders that could be counted on to be faithful in their teaching uh, about Jesus. And of course, that's, that's the, what we have leaders in our churches today, whether they are ministerial staff, full-time staff members like pastors, ministers of music and worship, ministers, youth ministers, student ministers, children's ministers. Uh, they are the they are leaders in the local church. And then you have, in, in Baptist churches, we have deacons who are selected by the church to lead out in, in ministry, not in position of honor, and authority, but of service, uh, 
checking on the people and trying to help the members of their congregation. <clears throat> and then filters on down to Bible teachers like Sunday school teachers, leaders of Bible study and discipleship training. Uh, these are these are people that have responded to the gospel message and have committed themselves in faithful service and are able to be used by God to teach others. It reminds me of um, the verse in 2 Timothy. I need to read it to you. Uh, uh, Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, where Paul writes uh, to, actually he's writing to Timothy, who uh, was one of his missionary uh, uh, followers. And uh, he says, the things that you have heard from me, Timothy, among many witnesses, commit these things that I've taught you to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And that is the heart and the key of discipleship. As we have come to faith in Jesus, as, as God has uh, taught us through Bible study, through the preaching, teaching this word, through the testimony and encouragement of other Christians, and just through uh, God's dealing with us, as we've grown in faithfulness and in service to God, we are to teach others, even young Christians, uh, immature Christians, uh, new Christians, uh, to share with others so that we can help them grow and there'll be others that can help us grow. Commit to faithful people, and they in turn will commit to others. And so the, the perpetual spread and movement of Christian discipleship will be accomplished. That's what Jesus commanded us to do back in his recorded in Matthew chapter 28, where he said, go, into, go, out, uh, go out to all parts of the world and make disciples, teaching them the things that I have taught you. He was saying that to the original, in that, in that case, 11. Judas was already gone and had, had died, uh, Judas of Iscariot. But he was committing that, that task of discipleship to his followers. And he is in turn, through scripture, through that scripture, committed that same commissioning of us to be disciples, to be ambassadors for Christ, to teach others the things that God has taught us. Let's be faithful to that task as we live day by day. Father, thank you for these verses that we looked at today and the reminder that we not only have the privilege and opportunity of trying to spread the gospel, and to help Christian converts grow in discipleship. <clears throat> we can't save anybody, but we can share the gospel message, and you, your Holy Spirit, will draw those who are ready to be saved uh, to faith in Christ, and then we can teach the commandments and teachings of God and help them to grow in their Christian service and life and to in turn teach others. Let us be faithful to that task. I pray this in Jesus' name.